just try to tell us about, it looks completely different on my screen. <laughs> <laughs> so the colors are much brighter here. So I want to tell you something about quantum entanglement and photosynthesis. And I chose the topic because I think it's really amazing that two topics that are quite unrelated, come to think of it, biology and quantum mechanics can meet so beautifully. So, okay. I want to give you a short overview. I want to first, first I want to review some biological preliminaries, not much, only that you have the stuff that you can, um, that you know what I'm talking about and that you know what impl implication it has. Then some, then the main topic is quantum entanglement. Of course, in the LHC, you will see what that will come to mean. And um, finally, I will talk about the implications and the significance of this discovery. So, what is photosynthesis? Not much, just what you need to know is that it is a chemical process converting energy of photons to chemical energy and mainly used by plants, alga, and bacteria. So you see, there actually is quite a large amount of photosynthesis on our world, so um, it's quite important. So how does this actually work? We have proteins gathering light, and they are located in some organelles in, in, the, in the cells of plants and algae, and these are called chloroplasts. So um, if we look at it a bit more detailed, then we have um, Protein, uh, then we have proteins and pigments on special antenna proteins. And these are co called LHC. So um, the most important thing in the process of photosynthesis is the photosystem. You can see it's quite a mess if you come to look at it. So nothing you really wanted to describe with quantum mechanics. So the function of this photosystem is uh, the photochemistry, so uh, the first step in photosynthesis, the absorption of light and the transfer of the energy and electrons. Um, we will mainly be concerned not with the whole photosystem, but just with a tiny bit of it. Um, it consists of a reaction center that is just an enzyme um, using light to break up molecules and uh, the LHC. And it's not what you're thinking it is, because biologists that just don't ca care for the Large Hadron Collider. Instead, it is a light harvesting complex, as you can see here below. So you see, here is the, electro uh, here is the reaction center, and here we have the light harvesting complex. So we have various <coughs> proteins, and this is just a pathway that an excitation can go because um, the property piece of the LHC is that it enhances the absorption of light and it can transfer uh, energy to the reaction center. So uh, you see there are quite various of them and that what it is, is what it is actually. Um, it consists of proteins and of, uh, I just forgot, but some others as well. So it's, it really is a complex many body system. So how does this actually work, the energy transport in the LHC? Um, the first explanation was that it could be dipole-dipole uh, mediated excitation. But if we have a closer look at it, the characteristics of this energy transport is we have very high energy, uh, transfer rates and very high efficiency. So that is up to 99%. So, um, and moreover, it's stable under a variation of temperature. So um, our model using dipole-dipole mediated excitation is just not able to fully explain the energy transfer. So some physicists came up with an explanation um, including quantum phenomena. So we will try to get a general notion of this. Um, the quantum phenomena actually involved are, first of all, coherence and decoherence delocalization and stable entanglement. That is quite amazing in a biological system of such a complexity to find stable entanglement, but we will talk about that later. 
So, there is actually growing experimental support. If you want, I can tell you later about that because it's quite amazing. So, what actually happens is um, we have our LHC and proteins surrounding it, and they are quite close to one another. So, um, we have <coughs> dipole dipole interaction, and so we have um, mediated uh, coherent oscillation that are called um, uh, quantum oscillations. And so we get quantum entanglement. This permits to sim uh, simultaneously sample the tra transfer pathways. So uh, we can choose the most efficient one that way. But that is only part of it. That's only the half of the truth because it's a biological system. So we don't have a regular lattice or something like that. We have quite an irregular one, to be honest. And so we also get destructive interference and localization. That is absence of diffusion. And that is definitely not what we, want to, what we would want to have in that case. So that does not fully explain what our transfer rates. We have to include dephasing noise. Why um, dephasing noise uh, inhibits localization? Because localization heavily depends on, um, uh, on a fixed phase, uh, phase difference. So, um, to, to sum it up, we have coherent oscillation that preserves quantum coherence, and uh, our coherence survives even over very large spatial distances and over quite large times. So, we are talking about uh, picoseconds and something like 30 angstrom. So, to, bit of, to get a bit more quantitative, um, we have a two-level system because the LHC can only support one excitation. So, we had, have zero and I. Um, it is quite important that our Hilbert space is re restricted to the zero or one excitation. So we can write an arbitrary state in the manifold uh, just by decomposing the density matrix row like this. You've actually seen that, uh, I think, a lot of times. So I just have to skip a little bit, I think, because I'm losing time. Um, so uh, to quantify our entanglement, it is, really, uh, it is normally quite difficult to do so because um, you know, mu uh, multiple entanglement, that's, that is a difficult topic, but we have only one excitation or zero excitation in our system. That greatly simplifies it, because um, now um, non-local coherence is not only a necessary, but also a sufficient condition for entanglement. So we can use the standard measure, sorry, to define bipartite entanglement, that is concurrence. Um, it's normally defined like this, so in our case, we just get a very simple version of this, as you can see. For global entanglement, we have to introduce uh, a new measure that is E of rho. And you can see we have here something that looks a bit like the phenomenon entropy. Here, the phenomenon entropy, I hope you all know it. It's just the trace of rho log rho, and it's, um, it's an extension of the Ent uh, entropy we already know in the classical case, the quantum case. So, um, you can see that this one is, just as we have said above, also uh, a measure for the um, coherence. By c that's quite easy to see. This one has no coherence, obviously. We just artificially removed everything that could induce coherence. And so here are all the coherence terms. So, um, we can, now we can do a numerical simulation of this by applying uh, both the theory about our LHC and quantum information. We will focus on a very simple LHC that is the FMO complex. You can see it has three proteins here. That is, they are all equal and each consists of seven chromosomes. So this is the most simple model we will get. And Therefore, it is used, quite simply. So, um, we want to uh, look for dynamics that are 
uh, given by a non-perturbative, non-Markovian quantum master equation. So what we obtain, you can see here that our bipartite entanglement has a peak here and then oscillates. That's just um, the coherent, uh, the transition terms in the density, uh, in the Hamiltonian between, between the first and the second, um, here, between the first and the second one are quite large. So if we start at the first, we have a high bipartite entanglement and then we get dephasing processes so it starts to, uh, so it decreases. So we have approximately the same for global entanglement. So um, that was quite short, but I want to get to the fascinating topics. That is, we can actually formalize this. We get a Hamiltonian for the photosynthetic system. As you can see, we have quantum uh, annihilation and creation operators for excitons at, the, at a certain site. That's the sites are just my uh, chromophiles I had before. So uh, in the case that these two, uh, the site energy and the Coulomb coupling, scale equally, we have to use non-perturbative dynamics. But now we will be mainly, that was the simulation I just showed you. But now we will mainly be concerned with uh, the case that um, the side energy is much larger. So what do we get? Um, we have to uh, introduce uh, uh, dephasing, I told you. So we just couple it to a thermal a phonon bath and a radiation field. So we get an interacting Hamiltonian with a phonon coupling and an excitation phonon interaction. It is quite important to note that this one just induces jumps in one uh, excitation manifold. And this one describes the transition between excitation manifolds. You can see this. Um, here we have, uh, we, every time we decrease one here, if we, uh, if we increase one, we decrease another one. So the, these are just describes, the, this one just describes jumps. So with these, it is possible to formulate a Lindblad master equation. Um, are you all familiar with the theory of open quantum systems? <laughs> this will be taught in uh, the quantum information. Okay, so, and this describes actually the evolution of a density matrix in an open system. Um, it is quite a common form. Um, yeah, I just I think I don't have the time to explain it further. Um, but the important thing is, you get a form that is quite common and that can be actually computed in every detail. So these coefficients and these Lindblad operators are all known. So furthermore, we, can, we have an energy transfer efficiency. That is quite important because that's the way we can, um, we can compare our experimental results to what we actually computed here. So um, how we define it is just um, the integrated possibility over, uh, of successfully leaving, uh, of an excitation successfully leaving a channel and actually getting into an acceptor. Um, that is what is written here. Um, it is a little bit more easy to see for transfer times. So here we just integrate over T as well. This is a normalization factor. So. With this, we have all the basics to go to the FMO complex, and we get an enhancement of the energy transfer efficiency by 25%, and that means we just have the 099 we experimentally measured. So we are fully able to explain this with our theory. There can actually be a numerical evaluation of this, because um, the Lindblad equation can be easily um, included in uh, in Monte Carlo methods and Monte Carlo simulations. So, what is the implication of what I just showed you? Um, it is crucial for our understanding of biological structures, of course, and the link between quantum physics and biology. That is what I think is most fascinating. Um, it might enable us to create artificial photosynthetic systems. Why might that be interesting? It might lead to a um, emission-free 
um, renewable source for um, electronic energy. So, and it could, in a, it could help us with quantum-based technologies because when you recall, our, um, our FMO complex is a wire. It, is, it just serves to get excitations from one place to the other. So we could maybe could use this as well in quantum computation. So what have we seen? There are connections between quantum mechanics and biology. We have further explored upon the quantum phenomena that are crucial for photosynthesis. We have developed the theoretical fr framework in lint platform. And we have seen that quantum effects play a large role in the description of energy transfer dynamics. So what I want to conclude with is simply that quantum effects form an important part, uh, important part of other sciences as well. And what I think is, best of all, sometimes you just find physics where you don't expect it. Okay, let's thank. <laughs> time for any questions so I tell you that the session is over my friends and <laughs> would like to thank you for very hard work for good presentations and for your attention to other speakers and participation in the form of asking questions and I hope we have some uh, time for wine and cheese now <laughs> <laughs>